In this video, we're going to look at how to answer another example section C question for the 2022 AS Skeleton Code. We're going to look at this question here. We're going to read it, then I'm going to show you one possible answer to the question. Uh, when I show you the answer, we're going to look at what adjustments I made to the code, why I made these adjustments, and how I reached these ideas in the exam. Hopefully by the end of this video, it will give you a better idea of how you should approach AS Section C questions. So, let's read this question now. One benefit of using a digital version of the number puzzle is helping the user with error checking. Sometimes, users may enter the same number twice in the same column, row or grid without realising. Task 1. You should create a subroutine which should be called when the user enters their number into the grid. Call this subroutine repeated digit check. The subroutine will check if the digit the user has entered already appears in the same row, column, or 3x3 three three grid. If the item is a repeat, the following prompt should appear to the user. The number you entered is already repeated within the row, or column, or grid. The program must specify if it is the column, or row, or 3x3 three three grid that the number is repeated in. All right. Let's take a look at a possible solution now. Um, just understand the solution is not a perfect solution, um, as I put certain things in place on purpose uh, to help explain how I went about doing it, which we'll look at later on in the video. First, you can see I've named a subroutine repeated digit check. This is from the question. I've then decided to assign three variables uh, the first two being row number and row and sorry, column number. Um, these are going to be used so that we know what row or column is being referred to by the user. They take in the positions from the user's input of cell info, which comes from the solve puzzle subroutine. Um, now, if you know this code well enough, you might be thinking to yourself, doesn't the code already assign variables like this? That is correct, but at the point where I call this subroutine later on in the code, which you can see uh, yourself, these variables haven't actually been assigned at that point. So to avoid the trouble, I chose to create my own ones here in this subroutine. So next, we've got this uh, Boolean variable, repeat in row. Uh, this is a value we will use to identify if the user's number is repeated in the same row. Uh, we then have a count variable to help us move through a while loop. In the while loop, you will see we have two conditions. There's a while count is less than 10. Uh, that will allow us to check through the nine digits in the row. And then while repeat in row is false. I'm using an AND here because the loop should stop as soon as one of those conditions is not met. Uh, I also want to point out, normally count would start at 0, but in this one I've started at 1 because the very first position, so position 0 in each row's array, is actually empty. So there's no point in checking for this. Um, although you could if you wanted. Um, now that we're in the while loop, uh, you can see the first line is an if statement, uh, and it's comparing the value in the puzzle grid. The row number we know is chosen by the user, um, okay, and the count is used to allow us to move through each of the uh, items in that particular row. Uh, as this value increments, we'll move through the entire row. With each item in the row, we are checking if it's the same as what the user entered as their last digit in cell info. If this value is true, we will set repeat in row to true and output the message value repeat in the row. If it's not, we'll increment count by one and move over to the next value in the row. This exact same concept is applied with moving through the column in the next while loop over here. Uh, the only difference is we're putting count first and column number after, and this is because count now represents each row, but column number will ensure we look at the same position within each row, making us look down only one column. You notice I'm also using repeating column now instead of repeating row. 
Uh, this is all pretty straightforward so far. Where it gets a little bit complex is with the 3x3 three three rows, uh, which we'll move over. So I'm not going to explain this because this is already this is pretty much the same as what we've already seen. Um, I've got 3x3 three three rows over here. Okay. So to figure this out, we need to find a way of locating which 3x3 three three grid the user is entering a value into. We can do this by using selection with their row number and column number. When we find out the user's row number, we can see if the user is in the top three grids, the middle three grids, or the bottom three grids, by seeing what the number is. If their number is less than four, they're in one of the top three rows, uh, which means they're in one of the top three grids. Okay. If their number is between four and seven, they're in one of the middle three by three grids. And if the number is seven and over, they're in one of the bottom three by three grids. Once we've figured out which row of three by threes the user is in, we've effectively narrowed ourselves down to just three by three grids, or three three by three grids. Count how many times I say three in this video. Um, we now need to find out uh, which one of these three the user is trying to add the value into. This is done by checking the column number uh, in the same way we do the rows. So if the row number, so if the column number is less than four, we're in the first grid. If it's between four and seven, we're in the second grid. If it's seven or above, we're in the third grid. You, you can then see with using these two for loops, making a nested for loop, we can iterate through the three by three grid. Then these lines you've, uh, you've seen before. Um, you can look through all this code on your own, as it's already just been explained, uh, so I won't waste time for repeating the explanations. They're all the same, but just referring to different parts of the code, or the grid, sorry. Um, so yeah, I've uh, chosen to, uh, to add these lines in the subroutine. These lines are used to report back to the code if a value has been repeated, with the intention for it to prevent the value from being entered. However, the question I gave you doesn't actually require this, so you'll see I don't really make use of this properly when the subroutine is called in solve puzzle. Um, I did this because I, I, I just, I think I misread or, mis or just forgot what the question was asking. I kept it in just in case you want to use that to kind of help you figure out how to then go and prevent the user from entering a value. So that's what I did and why. But how did I work this out in the exam? So the first thing I wanted to know was where can I find the most updated version of the grid at any given time? What the user is seeing on screen when playing must be stored somewhere in a variable. But where is that? To find this, as I know a solve puzzle, is when you just play in the game, I knew I should look there. So I'll go over to solve puzzle, um, which we'll find eventually. So I just go past David, so puzzle. Okay. Um, now within solve puzzle, uh, that's where I found puzzle grid. And I know that in, in uh, solve puzzle, the user's values are eventually being placed into puzzle grid. You can see there on line 313. Okay. I then wanted to just test to make sure just so I can see what was in Puzzle Grid. So I outputted a Puzzle Grid here. That's why that line there at 281 is there. Um, I then needed to find a way for referencing the column and rows. Okay, so what column and row is the user entering their value into? That was very important. So I can check which row, column, and 3x3 three three grid to iterate through. Now, I know from this program, the user enters their values into a variable called cell info. So that's what I needed, okay? And that was all the information that I needed, really, in order to get started on programming. The rest was somewhat straightforward from there. And you can see that because I've already explained it, okay? And that's everything you need to know about how to answer this particular uh, question, if it does come up.